Namaskar and welcome to Diplomatic Dispatch. I'm your host, Vikas Swaroop. Today marks our 10th episode, and we will use this special occasion to discuss a very special relationship. President Vladimir Putin has just concluded a visit to New Delhi for the 21st annual summit between India and Russia. Prime Minister Modi himself has now interacted with President Putin 40 times since 2014 in bilateral and multilateral settings. And every such occasion serves to remind us of the special and privileged strategic partnership between India and Russia. Historically, whether it was Kashmir, where the Soviet Union used its veto to stop anti-India resolutions at the UN Security Council, or the liberation of Bangladesh, when it blunted President Nixon's move to dispatch the 7th Fleet to the Bay of Bengal in support of Pakistan, Moscow stood by India in times of crisis. India has also been, in President Putin's words, a time-tested friend. In 1971, the two countries signed the Indo-Soviet Treaty of Peace, Friendship and Cooperation, and in October 2000, the relationship was upgraded to the level of a strategic partnership. Today, this strategic partnership encompasses everything, from science and technology to education to culture. But the five key pillars remain politics, defense, economy, energy, and space. On the political side, India-Russia ties are characterized by mutual trust, respect for each other's core national interests, and a similarity of outlook on many international and regional issues. Russia and India are on the same page on matters of international terrorism, addressing pandemics, and acting on climate change. The two countries work together in a number of multilateral platforms, such as G20, BRICS, Shanghai Cooperation Organization, Russia-India-China Trilateral Grouping, the Financial Action Task Force, and the East Asia Summit. When it comes to defense, Russia has always been a dependable supplier to India and has not hesitated in sharing the most advanced technology. That is why 60 to 70 percent of India's defense equipment is of Russian origin. The cooperation has now moved beyond a buyer-seller relationship. The BrahMos cruise missile is a shining example of the India-Russia partnership in defense. India-Russia bilateral trade registered an increase of 38% this year, but is still languishing at under $10 billion. India's cumulative oil and gas investment in Russia exceeds $16 billion. And with Rosneft and its partners purchasing SR Oil, which was renamed Nayara Energy, Russian investments in India exceed $18 billion. In terms of civil nuclear energy, the Kudankulam nuclear power plant in Tamil Nadu was the first beneficiary of India's resumed civil nuclear collaboration with international partners and has been described as a flagship joint project for the India-Russia partnership. Russia's support for India's space program began a long time back. Wing Commander Rakesh Sharma flew aboard the Soviet rocket Soyuz T-11 to become the first Indian in space in 1984 and now Russia is training four Indian crew members for Gaganyaan, India's first manned space flight. Connectivity has emerged as a major new theme in India-Russia cooperation. The two countries are working to build the International North-South Transport Corridor, which will link India and Russia through Central Asia and Iran, and cut down the transit time for goods from 40 days to just 20. There is also a proposal to develop the Chennai-Vladivostok Eastern Maritime Corridor to connect India to Russia's Far East, which is rich in minerals, hydrocarbons, timber and fish. The two countries have also cooperated closely in fighting COVID-19, with India sending medicines to Russia during the first wave and Russia sending medical equipment during India's second wave. India has also allowed use of the Sputnik V vaccine in India. Coming to the visit of President Putin, it was short but substantive, marked by the signing of 28 agreements and resulting in a 99-paragraph long joint statement titled India-Russia, Partnership for Peace, Progress and Prosperity. To discuss the outcomes of the visit and the future of the India-Russia relationship, 
I have two eminent guests who know Russia intimately. Joining me in the studio is Ambassador Ajay Malhotra, who has been India's envoy to Romania, Kuwait and Russia and is currently chairperson of the Advisory Committee to the United Nations Human Rights Council in Geneva. Joining us via video link is Mr. Nandan Unnikrishnan, a former journalist who served as PTI's chief of bureau in Moscow and is currently heading the Eurasian Studies program at the Observer Research Foundation. A very warm welcome to both of you. Let me begin with you, Ambassador Malhotra. President Putin has just been to India for the 21st annual summit between the two countries. How do you assess his visit? Well, President Putin's visit was a short and sweet one. Um, what, uh, it was only five hours long or so they say. Um, but what was nice about it is that despite the pandemic spreading across Russia uh, and other concerns, uh, including uh, allegations that Russian troops have amassed uh, along the Ukrainian border, he found the time to come and meet a friend of long standing uh, in India and in particular Prime Minister Modi with whom he has a long standing friendship going back till 2001 when they first met and certainly since 2014. So it was a very productive visit as gauged by both sides and beyond the 28 agreements signed, I think the optics of the fact that the Russian president felt it important that he traveled to India, I think that was very important to be taken note of. Mr. Unnikrishnan, President Putin's visit was preceded by the two plus two dialogue mechanism that brought together the foreign ministers and the defense ministers of the two countries on a common platform. Now, this is a mechanism that we have used so far only with our Quad partners, that is the United States, Japan and Australia. How significant was the institution of this new dialogue mechanism with Russia? I think it is very, very important that this uh, new format has started. Uh, my personal view is better late than never, because if you compare those with whom this institution exists, uh, Russia has the most, uh, the longest defense relationship with, uh, with us. And we have compared notes with Russia on foreign policy for uh, decades. So I personally uh, welcome this. And secondly, I think in the current geopolitical flux, it is very, very important that uh, the two countries stay uh, well informed about the developments in their neighborhoods, and particularly in our particular confrontation that we are having with uh, our northern neighbors, uh, Russia is a player in that uh, situation. Ambassador Malhotra, what were the major outcomes on the military side, and how do you see the future evolution of the India-Russia defense relationship? Well, one of the major outcomes was the signing of the long-term cooperation program on military and multi, military technical cooperation between India and Russia. Uh, that is a fairly traditional uh, document by now because they have signed several uh, of it, but its continuation is important because it sets in place all the areas, and there are many of them, uh, where things have to be done, and everyone has a clear idea then of what lies ahead for the next 10 years. So that was um, to be expected. The second was the finalization uh, of the revamped version of the AK-203 rifle contract, which was signed in the morning uh, before uh, President Putin arrived. Um, uh, why is that important? Again, we have been using otherwise the INSAS rifle uh, since 1998, and it was time we went beyond it. Otherwise, you had a situation where sometimes our armed forces ran into terrorist groupings who had more, uh, uh, more uh, superior, yes. superior sort of weaponry than us. And so this is a good weapon, it has uh, good credentials, and the fact that it is being made in India is also very noteworthy. The third thing I think, though nothing was signed, the fact of its implementation, I think, relates to the S-400. This is a weapon system, in my view, we should have, uh, or any similar weapon system, we should have got long, uh, long ago. Uh, it, there's a little bit of irresponsibility that we didn't have something like this to defend our average citizen in a situation where we are uh, faced by aggressive and nuclear uh, neighbors with nuclear weapons. So um, since this is best of class, I think it is a very welcome development. As you know, it can tackle. So has the relationship really now moved beyond a buyer-seller relationship? 
Oh, yes, uh, for sure. I think Brahmos is a good example uh, where, uh, where, where we have gone beyond to design, development and manufacture and we have been thinking in terms of export. So, yeah, uh, now with the uh, emphasis on Atma Nirbhar, uh, a lot of, uh, we hope to get some production also in India, but most of these weapon systems have some technology transfers. So if we are doing so well in defense, why is it that we are not doing so well in trade? Uh, one, you have Russia being under sanctions. So uh, in the present situation, not many are willing to venture out. In I'm talking of the private sector. You know, much of what we get from Russia, including in trade, does not show up in our statistics. One is defense, which we discussed. Two is diamonds, which come via the Indian community mm -hmm. in Brussels and uh, Antwerp, Antwerp and uh, out of um, uh, Israel. Uh, and we are the main exporter of these um, uh, small and medium-sized diamonds out of India. 90 to 95 percent of the world's uh, requirements are met by India. M about 50 percent of them come from Russia. And, but they come through these circuitous mm -hmm. routes, so they'll show up in uh, EU-India trade or Israel-India trade, but not in Russia-India trade. The same applies to oil and gas, for example. The biggest investments India has done abroad are in oil and gas. We have put in over $17 billion. And the return we get, the most oil we get in terms of oil equity also is from, Russia. from Russia. But it doesn't show up here because we sell it on the high seas. You get it from Sakhalin. You sell it to Japan and Korea who are right there. It makes sense. It is cost effective. And we buy the grades that are suitable for our refinery uh, from the Gulf and other areas. But despite all of this, I think till sanctions are removed, um, this may not be uh, a relationship which will go forward. And the reason is not due to government-to-government -to -government interaction, which is, I would say, at an A-plus level. The reason is private sector hesitancy. Mr. Oni Krishnan, how important is India's potential membership of the Eurasian Economic Union? And when are negotiations likely to begin? Well, as far as I understand, the negotiations are already in process. I, I, I will not be able to uh, make a guess as to when exactly we will uh, join. But uh, I think there is an advantage in uh, at least participating in the Eurasian Union uh, in terms of access to the markets and maybe one of the ways of circumventing some of the sanctions as it were that uh, Mr. Malhotra was talking about because if you take it through uh, Kazakhstan for example uh, which is a member of the Eurasian Union then uh, there is a free sort of uh, ability for Kazakhstan to uh, carry the goods forward into uh, Russia. So in that sense, we will uh, benefit. But for all this, please do remember that we have to primarily establish connectivity. So if you're talking in terms of investment, yes, there is a humongous potential. But if you're talking in terms of trade, apart from sanctions, which uh, Mr. Malhotra mentioned, another impediment, in my opinion, in trading with uh, the Russians or even the Central Asians is the lack of direct connectivity. Ambassador Malhotra, Russia has been trying to attract India's attention and investment in its Far East region. How do you see the prospects? Well, the prospects are reasonable, I would say, uh, provided we play this game properly and uh, the Russians uh, also join in, which is happening. Uh, certainly, the, the pandemic, uh, COVID pandemic has... Um, introduce certain speed breakers, but uh, the process is underway. As you know, uh, we had agreed on a Vladivostok Chennai maritime corridor. This is not a new proposal. It was there in 93. It was implemented, in fact, earlier too, um, between Vladivostok and India. And it floundered a bit because you didn't have enough um, uh, goods going both ways at that time. But the world has changed since then, and our requirements and our ability to access things from the Russian Far East has also changed. And we are also looking now at the possibilities of trilateral cooperation. If you look at the Russian Far East, you must appreciate also that in the Russian scheme of things, and that has been agreed to, it extends also to the neighboring Arctic zone. So that gives us other opportunities to do things. We have interests. There's forestry, there's um, um, a lot of raw materials, there's oil and gas, uh, there are diamonds in Sakha, for example. So the prospects are good. Mr. Unni Krishnan, Ambassador Malhotra mentioned the Arctic. Now, as an observer state of the Arctic Council, India is also interested in deepening its engagement with Russia, which is the current chair of the Arctic Council. 
Russia plans to begin year-round shipping via the Northern Sea Route that passes through the Arctic in the next two years, people say as early as 2022 or 2023. How can India benefit from this? Well, the primary benefit, the way I see it, is that India will cut short the amount of time it takes to take goods from India to Northern Europe. I think uh, the Northern Sea Route reduces the uh, uh, time it takes by more than a week. So that, of course, is of great benefit. Uh, it also then works in the other direction. So we are able to bring what we want from there much, much faster. Uh, apart from this, I think in the broader context, when the joint statement, for example, spoke of the complementarities between India's understanding of the Indo-Pacific, the Russian vision of a greater Eurasia, I think you have to, we have to keep in mind that this greater Eurasia is also inclusive of the Arctic zone. And so any complementarity and cooperation extends into the Arctic zone. The third thing is my primary uh, reason why I think India should be engaged in the Arctic as well as uh, in the Russian Far East is again, I'm looking at it from uh, what I would call a strategic prism. It does give then Russia that extra strategic space vis-a-vis -vis its uh, neighbor to the South China and gives uh, Russia options in terms of whom it chooses as a partner in that region. Ambassador Malhotra, let me now move to some areas of divergence between India and Russia. The principal one is the Quad. Now, India sees it as a platform for cooperation in the Indo-Pacific with like-minded countries, but Russia has characterized it as a devious policy by Western powers to engage India in anti-China games. How do we bridge this gap? Well, uh, let's look at these concepts, first of all. Both of them are Western academic creations, Asia-Pacific and Indo-Pacific. For the Russians, it was always a Asian landmass, and now as they talk of the Greater Eurasian Partnership, which is something that they've endorsed in their uh, 2021 uh, national security strategy. Uh, if you find all the references in that document are only to Asia-Pacific. Now, when we talk of Indo-Pacific, yes, they say, well, the Americans are using this as an attempt to corner the Chinese, and we are concerned that it might be used against us at some stage. When we explain that, no, it is not free and open, but free, open, and inclusive, then they said, okay, that's better, and we could perhaps live with it, but that's not the American version. So there, is some, there are some um, angularities that need to be sorted out, but uh, I think uh, at the moment, we, we could well get around the squibble, and I think the creation of this new uh, tripartite security structure, um, AUKUS, might well uh, put this aside for some time because that is a more threatening one. Yes. And that is not only threatening, that is certainly threatening to Russia also because nuclear-powered submarines, wherever they might be, uh, could be used by any of these um, allies now against them. And it's not only nuclear-powered submarines that Australia will be provided under AUKUS, and that is finalized only in September this year, uh, but also sharing of um, uh, intelligence, um, uh, underwater, uh, cooperation under underwater affairs, etc. So this is something of concern. So I, I, I do believe now Quad uh, pales away in significance, and I think we can get our heads around it if, if we really want to. But there's a concern here because Australia also has a, a Western Indian Ocean side to it. So when we look at all of this, I think there are bigger concerns that may well distract. And uh, rather than quibble over that word, uh, we need to see what we need to do about these things because if Australian nuclear powered submarines come, that means Chinese ones will come also too, and that means Russian ones will also come, and that means all kinds of others. The French also have interests. And so that's a whole new world out there. Mr. Unnikrishnan, India also remains wary of the growing political and military partnership between Russia and China and their shared opposition to the Indo Pacific framework. Going forward, how do you see this dynamic playing out? Given the long relationship we've had with Russia, with the Soviet Union, where the Soviet Union, in a sense, was a balancer vis-a-vis -vis China too. Uh, the fact that the policymakers in Delhi are concerned is not surprising. However, I would share uh, the optimism 
that uh, Ambassador Malhotra has displayed by saying that, you know, these uh, uh, sort of impediments can be got around. I do believe that uh, the Russians should be judged more by their actions rather than just by their words on the Indo-Pacific or even the Quad. And if you uh, recall, they've just last week, they held a naval exercise with the ASEAN countries, uh, much to everyone's surprise. And uh, I think the Russians are also beginning to realize that they need a independent, greater footprint in the Indian Ocean region, as well as uh, in the Pacific. Uh, it'll take some time for them to adapt a terminology that is similar to us. But look at the joint statement. I mean, if you see the formulation on India and the Pacific, the security architecture in this region, it is virtually echoing the Indian vision, barring probably using the words of rule-based uh, order. But if you, uh, again, were to judge the Russians by what Mr. Putin says, you will find a more moderate and far more understanding approach. Would you like to come in on this? Well, uh, I would agree. Um, you see, Russia-China relations have never been as good as they are at present. And, but there are also certain misalignments there, and we, shouldn't, um, we should take note of that. For example, on Crimea, China does not recognize Crimea as belonging to Russia. And uh, Chinese interests in the South China Sea and East China Sea, Russia does not um, have anything much to say because it has interests with the countries, the competing uh, countries out there. So there, there is scope on Georgia and Ab uh, on Abkhazia, South Ossetia. China has not recognized those countries. So there are differences in perception. And I think if push comes to shove, they might be cooperating, but not cooperating to the extent of backing each other's pure national interests because they have nothing to do with them. So there, there, there are angles out there and there are um, concerns that have emerged uh, uh, relating, to, uh, relating to borders also, for example. Uh, and it may be good to highlight that because the border might be settled, but it is a riverine border on the maritime side and the river keeps changing course. And the river since uh, 2013 has already changed course. So you will have to again look, as it happens, some of the territory is going, uh, may go to China. So you would have to look at also what to do mm -hmm. with that. So a new rejig will have to be done. Mr. Unik Krishnan. If, if I may add just yes. one point is vis-a-vis -vis Central Asia. That is another area in which right now everything seems <clears throat> calm between China and Russia. But uh, the Russians traditionally view that as part of their sphere of influence. And I don't think they're going to be very tolerant of any other party that attempts to uh, supplant them there. Relations between the West and Russia have been at a very low ebb since 2014, following Russia's intervention in Crimea and the stringent sanctions imposed on it by a number of Western countries. Recently, President Biden held a summit with President Putin in Geneva. They also spoke to each other on the Ukraine issue. How do you assess the future of the U.S.-Russia relationship and how will it affect India-Russia ties? Well, I think India, of course, would like uh, the U.S.-Russia uh, relationship to be much less hostile than it currently is. And uh, we may not uh, expect any warmth in the relationship, but we would uh, expect much less hostility. But personally, I think the problems between uh, the West and Russia are structural. Uh, they are not going to vanish uh, into the haze, as it were. And uh, the best thing would be for the West and Russia to find some kind of uh, uh, via media to arrive at some uh, modicum of understanding on how to behave themselves in particular situations. And in critical areas like cybersecurity, arms control, they have already opened talks. And I think there has been uh, considerable progress there. As far as Ukraine is concerned, uh, you know, uh, I, I don't believe that any country that wants to invade, uh, invade a third party is going to allow its president, its defense minister, and several other important dignitaries including the foreign policy advisor to the president, to leave their country and start visiting some other area which is 6,000 kilometers away on the eve of something like that. So I uh, think these are all uh, sort of 
posturings. These are uh, uh, staking out strong negotiation positions. And I really don't visualize a war over Ukraine unless, and I'm making that very clear, unless some of Russia's red lines are crossed and President Putin recently outlined those red lines. So if there is reduction of tensions between Russia and the United States, I think we stand to benefit a bit. Ambassador Malhotra, Afghanistan figured prominently during the talks between President Putin and Prime Minister Modi. Are the two countries on the same page with regard to dealing with the Taliban? And how can they work together to stabilize the situation in Afghanistan? Well, uh, it's a good question because um, some time ago we were not on the same page. It's important to appreciate and recognize that. Uh, because of uh, Russian willingness to deal with the Taliban due to their own national interests and our unwillingness to do so. But willy-nilly, something has happened up there. We now have a re Taliban regime in power in Afghanistan. And yet, uh, our concerns also have been borne out. If you see what kind of uh, behavior you've got from the Taliban in Afghanistan, one, they are not an elected government out there. And the hope was that when they come in, they would try and do some things, be a little more inclusive, uh, get in, you know, not only other Pashtun groups, but also Tajiks, Uzbeks, Turkmen, and, uh, you know, there was talk about women being women, included, exactly. etc. And I would say also some good professionals who could help them really take it forward. Uh, but uh, nothing of the sort has happened. Instead, if you see the government they brought up there was linked, you had some important people from the Haqqani network who have been given important security uh, posts uh, within that structure that they have. So a cause of concern. I think the Russians also appreciate now uh, that there's no reason to be too forthcoming. Mm -hmm. Uh, their real concern was that, oh, maybe uh, uh, ISIS and uh, other groups, uh, Al-Qaeda, etc., uh, you know, other groupings out there who may threaten them uh, might get an upper hand. But it's, uh, it's um, uh, good to see that we have come closer together. This is reflected also in the fact of the meeting of our NSAs, for example, that had the Central Asian countries and um, Russia and us, Pakistan, China, did not attend. But, and the fact that we have now a, a, a program for taking all of this forward. I think there's a commonality of approach that now again exists because uh, our underlying concerns are the same. Um, because our concerns are the same. We, don't, we want peace, uh, a peaceful, stable, secure Afghanistan, but one also where you don't have extreme, extreme um, ideologies in place, one where you don't have illegal weapons, and, and especially for the Russians, illegal drugs, drugs coming out yes. and going across Central Asia into Russia. So these for them are important. For us, they're the same. We also don't want to, we want a government which is not anti-Indian. Uh, we want peace and security up there uh, for everyone. Not a problem with that. We don't want illegal drugs. Equally, if you look at our situation in some of our uh, border states uh, and uh, illegal arms also. Gentlemen, we have run out of time. Thank you very much for your insights. It is clear that India and Russia are not just a good fit for each other. They share a mature relationship that provides a measure of stability in an uncertain and changing world. Going forward, it is our expectation that India and Russia will continue to realize the full potential of their special and privileged strategic partnership. That is all I have for you tonight. Join me next week for a new episode of Diplomatic Dispatch. Till then, good evening and good night. <laughs>